In the halls of Minnesota's Carleton College, three students were ready to bring games back to the classroom. The Sumerian game and its ilk had started the category of education-focused games, but with its extremely in-depth systems and barriers of adoption because of the computers being used, it was never something people would go out of their way to actually play. Fun would have to come first for younger students to be able to engage with games properly, and that's something which Don Rowich understood. Rowich aspired to become a teacher and has spent the last semester teaching at various high schools around northern Minneapolis. His roommates, Bill Heineman and Paul Dillenberger, studied mathematics and taught in southern Minneapolis. They found that students didn't particularly engage with American history in some of the poor neighborhoods they went to. So Rawich looked to design a board game to teach a new course to his middle school students about the migration to the American West, built on top of an 1800s era US map. He took inspiration from other classroom games which involved the students taking on participatory roles for creative problem solving to craft a game about survival along the Oregon Trail a migratory path used by 19th century settlers moving west. He placed tiny squares for the students to move across the long valley road, rolling the dice over 12 turns to make it to the end, using their resources of oxen, food, ammo, and clothes from cards to bring them to Oregon, Willamette Valley. His roommates were on board with the idea, but Heinemann, in particular, was keen on computerizing it. Why? Well, the two of them had previously taken computer classes at Carleton, and there they met the school's HP 2100 series mini-computer. They had been taken with BASIC and wanted to create a program using that language. While the intention of creating a computer version was all well and good, Rawich needed to complete the program in two weeks. No problem, though, since it was relatively simple, and the basic layout was already there on paper. Heinemann did the large bulk of the programming, with Dillenberger and Rawich focused on the underlying routines to give it life, like dice rolls did to a board game. Heinemann and Dillenberger coded the game where they were working as student teachers, then brought the teletype back to their shared apartment for game testing on the weekend. They managed to hastily put together the program and first tested it on a few of their math students before Rowich's debut for his students. On December 3, 1971, the three wheeled a teletype into an 8th grade classroom at Jordan Junior High School, phoned into the mainframe, and presented the students with a look at their resource management game called Oregon. In terms of play structure, not much had changed from the board game prototype. Still traveling the dangerous road of the Oregon Trail, dealing with amenities and cattle, players were settlers who hedged their bets to survive one of the most perilous journeys imaginable, over 2,000 miles. The parser was quite simple, giving direct instructions per line with the corresponding key to press, each printout starting with a date in 1847 for context. Since the entire game was about making decisions, choices such as how much food to eat or medicine to use would become crucial given good or bad fortune later on. Good fortune came in the way of forts along the trail, and bad fortune from illness which could come about as a result of not eating properly or interceptions by unfriendly riders. Every turn had certain probabilities of events built into it, allowing for unique treks each time, with weather shifting as the player crossed undefined state lines. One of the unique features came in the form of using the firearm against game or encroaching riders, in which the player would have to type BANG as fast as they could in order to succeed. What lengths to go for action on a teletype, eh? At the end of the trail, a small ring of the teletype's internal bell was sounded to mark the student's job as done. The demonstration was a success. Even the students who failed, which were a great deal, were eager to come back to the game and continue to try to reach the end of the trail. While its curricular value may be disputable, Oregon was certainly not a game which is easy to put down. At least, to the players. 
The three teachers installed the game on the timesharing computer at the high school, making minor modifications based on faculty suggestions, but Rawich came and deleted it at semester's end. He kept the original source code on paper tape, but didn't intend to return to the game, as he felt the purpose of the program had been fulfilled. However, the story would take a turn. The booming timesharing infrastructure of Minnesota had led the state to become the hub for computerized education. So a statewide program was created to unify the various computer projects, the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, MECC. Rawich was redirected from his teaching dreams due to the ongoing United States military draft and thus found himself at the organization, finding it preferable to other military duties. Thankfully, he believed in their cause, and in 1975 dug up the old game to port the program to the UNIVAC 1100 at MEC headquarters with his former roommate's approval, and some modification. From there, it would become a popular game on MECC's timesharing network and was eventually distributed to more widely available computers once they emerged. Now that sounds familiar. Oregon is a game which brings about excitement and understanding through its subject matter, and creates an immediate bond between player and bit-coded person, or people in this case. The Sumerian game dealt with a higher authority overseeing a city of people, but Oregon really strikes a chord because it's about the struggle of families. Those who experienced it could project their own stories onto the game rather than purely viewing the names as resources. The intention was to get students making decisions to understand the plight of the settlers. Failure, that repeated failure to survive, was as close as storytelling, narrative, and game mechanics would meet each other for a long time. This was one way which players could find engagement with a digital program. The other was now developing to completely redefine two entirely different industries and make the first mass market impact of computer technology on world culture. Last we left Bill Harrison, Ralph Baer, and the now absent Bill Rush at the end of 1968, they had finalized the TV game number seven, The Brown Box, a prototype game machine which could hook into a standard CRT television with several games on board. It was all just blocks of light, but those blocks of light could move more freely and smoothly than any computerized counterpart. Save for Space War. Having failed to sell the machine to cable companies, it was time to gauge the interest of television manufacturers who may be interested in the technology as a way to enhance their existing business. At the time, the Japanese TV manufacturers had just introduced the Trinitron color television system, which was beginning to eat at the bottom line for the United States-based suppliers. On the lineup in 1969 were RCA, General Electric, Sylvania, Motorola, Warwick, and Zenith. RCA and GE entered negotiations for the product for a time, but both ultimately reneged on any formal license for the technology. It seemed that all their efforts had come to naught. The brown box wouldn't be manufactured. However, in a fortuitous turn of events, one of the executives at RCA who had informally been informed of the demonstration, William Enders, took a job at Magnavox, located in Fort Wayne, Indiana, in 1970. He encouraged the executive staff at Magnavox to have a look at the system, inviting the Sanders engineers to give a demonstration at Magnavox headquarters on August 26, 1970. While at first the reaction was not enthusiastic, Marketing VP Jerry Martin saw potential in the device and made it his mission to get approval from Magnavox for this development effort. Negotiations between Sanders Associates and Magnavox culminated on March 11, 1971, with a written agreement hammered out between the parties. For Bayer, Harrison, and Sanders, the practical work was done. 
While Bayer would continue to consult on the technical aspects of the product, what he provided to them would be the basis they would work from. The patents and technology would be licensed to Magnavox under a fee, paid to Sanders, not Bayer or Rush, to develop a home video game product. They designated the project 1TL200 and would base the functionality upon the existing brown box prototype, which included 11 basic games, the rifle, the golf putting controller, and color generating capabilities. The latter two would never come to fruition due to cost, leaving a simple set of functionalities. A maximum of two dots, controlled by the players, using a series of knobs. A third dot, which the hardware controlled, could be used as a ball or missile, which could be altered via a third knob in the sports games or repositioned via a reset button atop the controller. Finally, a vertical line could be generated on the screen. The dots could detect when they hit one of the objects or when they were shot by the light gun. This is all that the Magnavox team had to work with to create an electronic video game for home use. Much of the design of the project adhered to the brown box prototype, with a few key differences. It was decided at the beginning of the process to replace the switches at the front of the box with a series of dual-sided circuit cards to switch between the games. These cards would activate logic functions inside the console by bridging circuit connections which could turn a particular behavior, such as disappearing, on or off depending on the game type. Given the very strict limitations they had to work with, the team at Magnavox, led by George Kent, attempted to create compelling game experiences for their console, which marketing initially dubbed Skillovision. They would maintain the concept of overlays to establish some visual identity, but they would also add cards for education-style games and on-screen boards. They performed their first market test in Grand Rapids, Michigan, from July 26 to July 30th, 1971, at one of Magnavox's authorized television dealers in a mall with five games ready for demonstration. Now, it's unclear as to what Magnavox learned from their test markets, but clearly something changed. They held the subsequent test at three stores in October of 1971 in Los Angeles under a new product manager, Robert Frisch, and only then did Magnavox become convinced that they could make something of this console. Initially, they were not even sure if they could make the product available for 1972, but with rallying support and the possibility of their options lapsing, they finally approved the initiation of the product on February 2nd, 1972. One of the big changes would be de-emphasizing the games centered around action even though they were the games that got the best response, and an increased focus on traditional board and educational games melded with the TV set. They would get rid of the golf controller and make the rifle an addition to be purchased separately, using a mold crafted by the Japanese toy company, Nintendo. For creating the visual elements, they turned to contractor Bradford Coote, who had previously designed a few board games and toy products. They would work in cooperation with Steve Lehner from Magnavox to settle on 12 games for the base unit, all of which would have overlays save for table tennis, some of which would have peripheral elements like boards and dice. These elements, all together, would add up to five US dollars in manufacturing cost, on top of the 32 US dollars necessary to manufacture the console itself. This would, in turn, be sold to Magnavox dealers for $65 for a final retail price of $99.95, a drastic increase from projections at both Sanders and Magnavox. Initially, Magnavox wanted to do a fairly conservative production of the 1TL200 in only 18 major markets, exclusively through their Magnavox retailers. The conception of the product within the company was as an asset to help spur the adoption of Magnavox televisions, not as something new and revolutionary on its own. However, with the early reception proving positive, 
the manufacturing run was doubled from 50,000 to 100,000, with an expansion into seven additional markets. In April 1972, the product was first announced to the Magnavox shareholders and would be christened Odyssey. The electronic game of the future. This promotional film helped in the process of familiarizing the public with the idea of a video game, something which plugged into the television set, which was a totally alien concept at the time. In addition to this, Magnavox initiated a nationwide tour for their dealers to get them to see the device along with their other 1972 products. On May 24th, 1972, the Magnavox Profit Caravan arrived in Burlingame, California, with a public demonstration held at the Airport Marina Hotel. Among those who saw it there were a few representatives from Nutting Associates, including one Nolan Bushnell. He came away unimpressed with the demonstration, but brimming with a new idea in his head, being one of the many attracted to the Odyssey ping pong game. In September of 1972, Odyssey was released to the public. In the box would be the console, the master control unit, two detachable controllers connected by wires to the system, an antenna switch box, a 35-page manual, along with six two-sided game cards for the 12 available games, the 13th being held back for those who turned in their registration card. Supplementing these games were 11 plastic overlays, with sizes for both 18 and 25 inch televisions, four game boards, five stacks of cards, two dice, and a set of fake poker money. An AC adapter was sold as a separate accessory because, for some reason, the console could also be powered wirelessly using six included C-cell batteries. In case you wanted to, you know, play it at the beach. These games had very little in the way of constraints beyond how the various dots interacted with each other, so families would have to be attentive of score and game boundaries. The only element which could be variable was the speed, controlled by a knob on the back of the system. In many ways, it was a hybrid between screen-generated science and analog board game activities, highly encouraging group play. In fact, demanding it, since all of the games were two-player by default. The rifle games, which sold as a set for 25 US dollars, required one player to act as the figure being shot. Despite all of these limitations, Magnavox was empowered by the early test markets of the Odyssey and put a significant amount of advertising behind the system. But in trying to maximize their profits, they had limited its reach. A mistaken impression was formed by the exclusivity to Magnavox official dealers that the game system would only be compatible with Magnavox branded televisions, which was not true. It turned out that in the first holiday season, of the 100,000 plus units they produced, they only sold 69,000. Magnavox nearly discontinued the product at that point, but they received positive consumer feedback in the form of a survey card within the box which netted the respondents an additional gain. This prevented an outright shuttling of the product, but aside from a few additional game cards and a promotional price reduction in 1973, no effort was made to position the console as a major product. In all, they sold 350,000 of them over a three-year lifespan, a poor, if not disastrous showing for a new product category. Now, the Odyssey as a gaming device is primitive in every sense of the word. No sound, three dots at most, the art for the overlays is low rent, but it defined a market. It set an expectation for what a video game in the home could be. 
Not all of its ambitions may have been fulfilled, but the most important one, being first to market, was. It was only a matter of time before imitators emerged. Magnavox now held a very powerful patent on video game technology, though it did not give them carte blanche over everything related to it. We'll return to this topic in a later episode, but while the Odyssey technology was not in itself the basis for many future games, the presence of Magnavox in this industry would cast a long shadow over those who entered it. Perhaps the greatest threat to their power was starting to rise around the time of the Odyssey's release, and soon, all of the attention would shift out of the home as the business of games was about to be cracked wide open. Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney made their split from Nunning Associates in early June of 1972, after Bushnell realized that he wasn't going to be making the headway he wanted to with video arcade machines at the company. He had attempted to negotiate with Bill Nutting for a one-third ownership stake in Nutting Associates, but that was out of the question. Bushnell had also made contacts at amusement and slot giant Bally Manufacturing Corporation, and decided that he would make Syzygy an independent development company creating video games now that they had acquired some clout. The engineers bought an office in Santa Clara, California in June, hoping to go ahead with their strange hippie name for the company. Another company was already using the name, though, so Nolan and Ted brainstormed what anew. They had bonded together at Ampex playing the Chinese board game Go, so they assembled a list of Japanese Go terms to pick from. A taste of things to come. There was Sente, Hane, and Atari, a term for the intention of taking an opponent's piece, like check in chess. The latter was chosen out of the lot by the California Secretary of State's office, and it was incorporated on June 27, 1972, using money from their computer space royalties to start up. They would continue to use Syzygy as a name for business, but Atari was now their identity. When they started up, Bushnell arranged several deals. From Nutting, they had purchased a route of game locations, which they would run for income while putting together games which they could hopefully test at these locations. Bushnell had a game called Asteroid that he wanted to create. It had been a backup plan in case computer space was too hard to implement. He also contracted with Nutting to create a two-player version of computer space. And he arranged a deal with Bally to build one video game, in the first known use of the term, and a multi-layered pinball game for some upfront payment to finance the company. It reeked of overzealous ambition for a startup, not the least of which being the game which he described. A hockey-themed game with humanoid characters who could face in multiple directions with ice friction and a goalie. Regardless, Dabney went to work on the pinball machine and Bushnell would work on the nutting contract. To staff up the company, Bushnell hired the first two paid employees, Secretary Cynthia Villanueva and Engineer Alan Alcorn. Alcorn had worked with the duo at Ampex in the video file division, taking Bushnell's former office after he had left, but kept in contact as the latter developed his computer space prototype. Alcorn wasn't too thrilled to leave Ampex for downgraded pay and uncertain entrepreneurial prospects but the company was on shaky ground at the time, so he joined Atari with the knowledge that his Ampex job was always there waiting for him. When Alcorn arrived on the job, Bushnell directed him to begin work on a modified version of what he had in mind for Bally. To motivate him, he even told Alcorn that this contract was from General Electric to create a consumer television game, so he had to make it cheap. What Bushnell wanted was a tennis game 
where the players held rackets and they would swat their rackets when the player pushed a button to alter the trajectory of the ball. Clearly, Bushnell had not liked the simplicity of the Odyssey table tennis game, but what he was asking Alcorn to do was far beyond the scope of what he had accomplished in computer space. Not knowing where to start, Alcorn asked for Nolan's computer space schematics. They were provided to him, but he couldn't even read them. The crash course for Alcorn was not going to be an easy one. Eventually figuring out his own methods, Alcorn was left with an enormous challenge on his hands. At the very least, he could make something which in itself could be turned into the game Bushnell wanted if he could get the basics down. Working with the limitations of simple Texas Instruments TTL integrated circuits, he began to build something from nothing. Instead of an articulated figure, Alcorn created a simple vertical rectangle. These blocky, simplified graphics had the benefit of not needing a whole range of components as seen on computer space, and would therefore cut down on cost. To solve the issue of the ball's trajectory, as clumsily solved on the Odyssey with its English knob, Alcorn made the eight segments of the paddle deflect the ball at different angles, whether straight on or all the way to the edges of the court. Yes, the court had edges, as the top and bottom of the screen were solid to allow for more bouncing action within the space. Initially, they found that the ball was moving too quickly for return serves, but when they decreased it, the speed of the game became rather meandering. Alcorn introduced perhaps one of the most important innovations in early video games when he decided that the ball should initially start slow, then after a number of volleys, become faster and faster. In this simple realization, he created a linear difficulty curve. On top of this, he had to add amenities such as score, sound, and an idle mode. For sound, both Bushnell and Dabney had some high demands. They wanted sounds reminiscent of a competitive tennis match, with cheers and jeers to accompany the scores, different sounds for when the ball hit the sides of the screen, and ambient crowd noises. Again, this was way beyond what either of them had accomplished, and Alcorn had never worked with audio. By hooking into the circuit board, he found that he could generate two sounds. He told his bosses that if they wanted something better, they'd have to do it themselves. Neither of them stepped forwards. For score, he initially wanted to use a specific display chip, but the circuit cost five US dollars. Through using extra TTL chips, he could replicate the same functionality for only three US dollars, a process of elimination he adhered to through the whole project. He did have to add a few chips to create the attract mode, where the ball would bounce around without player input, meant to entice but not fulfill the desire to watch the television effortlessly move objects on the screen. In one final decision, Alcorn observed that his paddles could not reach the top of the screen. This was not intentional, but he decided that this was a positive, as it was possible for a skilled player to make a serve which was impossible to counter, and the game could not be played endlessly. This was just a demo. Bushnell had both promised Bally something more and didn't think a game like this could be a big hit. Yet, as they played it, they found it very fun. It didn't need any fancy controls, just a potentiometer to move the paddle up and down. It didn't need to seem space age, it just was. Best of all, if Bally accepted this, they had just saved a load of development time and money. Alcorn remained confused, as he had been expecting the games to be for consumers, and he was way over budget, but now was not the time to complain. In 
In September of 1972, Nolan flew to Chicago with the game inside a metal chassis with a TV tuner. He showed the game to the people at Bally, hoping they would find it suitable in fulfillment of the contract. The people at Bally said no, on the basis that the game was way simpler than what they had been promised, and only supported two players, which Computer Space had not. Bushnell then visited their amusement subsidiary, Midway, to see if they would take it. Still, a no. Having been rejected by his contractor, he had the option to offer it to Nutting Associates. At the time he was there, the Music Operators of America show was ongoing, so he stopped in to see Bill Nutting. Nutting denied him as well, not interested in the royalty offer being asked. A dejected Bushnell returned to California, but the crew at Atari knew they had a winner on their hands. They had to convince Bally to take the game, and the only way they could think of was to perform a location test. One of their locations in the route purchased from Nutting was Andy Capp's Tavern, located in Sunnyvale. It already had a computer space and did pretty well as far as their route went so it seemed like an optimal location. Alcorn and Dabney assembled a small unit with a TV, a hand-wired circuit board, and controls inside of a wooden box. In between the two potentiometers read the name of the game, Pong, for ping pong. They put the game on top of a wine cask at the bar and waited to see what would happen. Sometime later, they received a phone call about the machine having broken. Alcorn arrived to fix the problem, and he discovered when he opened the coin box to give himself a free play that it was overloaded with quarters. This was a good sign. Using what materials they had, Atari constructed a few full-size cabinets to test the game in other locations, and they did just as well. They informed Bally of these earnings, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. In this crucial moment, Bushnell made the decision that rather than let his game languish, Atari had to become a manufacturer. His two cohorts were hesitant about the idea, but he convinced them that this was necessary. They ordered parts for 75 cabinets on credit, hired some people, and set about assembling them as fast as they could, desperately hoping that local distributors would be interested in buying them. In finalizing this game, Alcorn added a set of instructions to the control panel insisted by Bushnell after Computer Space's controller woes. They read, simply, Deposit quarter. Ball will serve automatically. Avoid missing ball for high score. Not that the score could go all that high. With everything in place, Bushnell called up three local California distributors who had carried Computer Space, and in a single day, allotted 300 orders based on his salesmanship and the promise of getting in on something groundbreaking. It was there, in November of 1972, that Paul began shipping to the local West Coast distributors for a price of around 900 US dollars. So, Pong, the true birth of an industry. Though we've looked at over a dozen games before getting to this point, Pong is the progenitor of it all. Two paddle, a ball, and a dotted line down the center. That is what Pong was, and all it was intended to be. Somehow, though, it became much more than that. Every person in the coin-op industry eventually saw Pong and saw something new. 
and as I saw with Atari, something quite profitable. The success came after a blind gamble and forging an entirely new market that they would be at the head of. Though, not for long. Pong would be reproduced by companies inside and outside the industry by the dozens. Computer space had already been cloned prior to Pong's release, and the arcade industry generally had been adopting solid-state electronics over the past few years. It was easy for many of them to get on the bandwagon, and even companies outside the industry who worked in electronics saw the potential that Atari would not outmanufacture. While these games were ostensibly about sports, with their many names in an attempt to differentiate them, the proliferation of games based entirely on Pong to find a new genre in the world of TV games. Ball and Paddle. Pong may not be the first video game, but the actual industry as a means for innovation and expansion is directly a result of its success, and the success of its imitators. Of course, it itself is an imitator, though through indirect means. Ralph Baer had not been aware of Higginbotham's game when he was making the Odyssey, and the idea itself was created by Bill Rush. Nolan Bushnell communicated the rough idea to Alcorn based on his impressions of the Odyssey game, and from that came the ball and paddle game that the world is familiar with today. How that would hold up in court is another matter. 1972 is our kickoff point. The stage is set, the ball in motion. I'll see you in 1973.